Um, my name is Diego Ongaro. Uh, I was actually a student here up until 2014, uh, working with John Ofterhout, and now I'm out in the real world, um, but still doing the same type of thing. Uh, so this talks on Runway, a new tool that I've uh, built and open sourced. Um, so first, I'll get into why I think we need new tools for distributed system design, and I'll give you an overview of Runway and do some demos in Runway and then come back and uh, talk a little bit more about how you would go and build a Runway model yourself. Um, you, I think we have a lot of time today, so feel free to interrupt me if you have questions or comments. Uh, does anyone disagree that distributed systems are hard? <laughs> so. There's a number of reasons why they're, they're difficult for humans to think about. Um, so there's concurrency. You know, machines are uh, they're operating in parallel. They're sending messages to each other. And by the time you receive a message, um, it's already stale. The, the contents it's reflecting happened a while ago due to network latency. Uh, you have to deal with failures, but you also have to deal with failures that happen during failures. You know, you, you can't just put a try catch block and be done with it. Um, they will come at inconvenient times. Uh, the events, you know, you, you can write out the good case events in your system, uh, but then when you start injecting delays and failures, there's so many possible interleavings of what can happen. It's really hard to predict. And then because these things are running across the network, we usually have little visibility into what's going on and poor debugging environments. You know, you try to drop in a GDB and suddenly there's timeouts and your failure detector fires and good luck. Uh, so in, in this talk, I'm gonna use a lot of examples from Raft. Uh, Raft is a consensus algorithm. It was my PhD topic. Um, how many people here are already familiar with Raft? About half the room, cool. Um, so you don't need to know all the details, but uh, you do need to know it, it's split into two phases. Um, first, a raft cluster will elect a leader, and, and then it'll get that leader to replicate its log um, to the other servers in the cluster. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a big enough system to have very complicated bugs in it. Um, here's one that David Mazier has found. It involves uh, the top server's leader crashes, the bottom server becomes leader, crashes, top server becomes leader again, replicates things out a little bit more, crashes, and that's the scenario. And, and then the bottom server becomes leader again. And it took all that to show the bugs. So you, you really can't think one failure deep. You have to think about the entire state space. So what, what do we do? Um, in industry or even, I, okay, fine, in, in academia you get to do proofs sometimes, but in industry we kind of rely on these things on the left to find flaws. We, we lean on code reviews where hopefully some human is just going to look at the code and spot it, right? Or unit tests or randomized testing. We have a lot of approaches to find implementation bugs, but they're going to find localized bugs. Um, you know, the, the code you had in your head isn't what you wrote down in your editor. You write a test, you find it, you fix it. Great. But you really don't want to find a design error at this stage, right? A design error, um, you know, at, at this point you've already written production code. It's expensive to change. You might have to change quite a bit of stuff. This is not good. Uh, you want to find your design sooner, and then, of course, you can go and do all these uh, these approaches for figuring out the, these localized bugs. So what do we do in the design phase? Um, if we really wanted to do this well, I think we'd have goals around communication, goals around evaluating our design. So we want to... Uh, we want to communicate clearly about that design unambiguously. We want to build intuition. Uh, we want 
the define to be reviewable. So something that you know someone can take offline, point at, uh, think through. You want to discuss the issues, consider alternatives. And then you'd want to evaluate the design before you actually build the production code. So is it simple enough? Otherwise, it won't work. Is it correct? Is it, is it fast? Is it available? Is it scalable? Um, these are all things we should be doing in the design phase. But what we actually do in the design phase today, we, we've got whiteboards, got back in the envelope calculations. Maybe we write a design doc in plain English. Uh, Andy was suggesting earlier that alcohol is a commonly used tool today, but it's not really going to help. Um, so these things don't quite meet our goals, right? They, they might start to build the intuition, um, but we're still just writing code before we know whether it's a good idea. Whereas we could be doing these other things. We could be visualizing our designs. We could be specifying them and model checking. If you have time, sure, do a proof. Um, we could be running simulations to, to figure out if they're going to be fast enough, if they'll scale. Um, and we're not. And Runway hopes to change that. So Runway is built around the concept of a system model. Um, and a, a model is a, just a representation of a system that captures its essential components and omits irrelevant details. So here, here we've got a model of Raft. And it's simplified in that uh, the network is flat. You know, these machines just send messages to each other on a flat network. There's no processing time. They don't write to disk. Um, you know, but, but we are watching the core state variables in the protocol. Uh, over here, we've got the logs. And when you're thinking about log replication in Raft, it's really nice to have those lined up like that. Um, so Runway is, tries to combine these things into one tool. Uh, and, and all of these benefit from a small model. So if, if you tried to visualize a production system, it's too complex, right? You can't put all that on the screen. You can't review a specification that that's, that's so large. And you, your model checker is probably not going to terminate in time. Um, and by the time you just take the essence of your system, you can run a simulation. And you know, un under certain assumptions, you can start to feel pretty confident about it. OK. So what does Runway actually do? Um, you feed it a model file. And from that, you can run your, your model file serves as your specification, but it's also executable. So Runway can run that through a randomized simulator and produce an execution or a history of Things like server 2 received a message, server 3 processed one, server 1 sent one. And then from that execution, we can actually visualize that. So we can take it on the screen and animate it. Uh, we could also interact with the visualization to alter the execution that we have. <coughs> Another thing we can do if we run that execution for long enough or run a bunch of these is we can build up data about our design and then graph that. And then if we want to drill in, we can go back to the visualization. Or we can take that same spec and run it through a model checker. So now we're looking for, is there any possible way this design would enter a state that is known to be bad? And by the way, if there is, then that error is an execution that we can go up and look at instead of digging through log files. So the hope is if we put all of this into one tool, we can write one model and get many benefits from it. And maybe that's practical enough to use in industry. So let me do a couple of demos now, uh, starting with the too many bananas problem. Uh, if you want to follow along at home, this is live at uh, runway.systems. 
So the too many bananas problem goes like this. Um, you've got a few people in a house, and uh, occasionally one of them will get hungry. And uh, when they get hungry, they can eat a banana, and they're happy again. Okay, next person might get hungry, eats a banana, and they're happy again. If you run out of bananas, uh, you've got to go to the store and, oh, well, that, we got unlucky. The store didn't provide any bananas, but usually you go to the store, you can bring back a bunch of bananas and then eat one and be happy again. Um, so problem with bananas, as you all know, they go bad over time. They spoil. So uh, in this model, we don't ever want to have more than eight bananas at the house at any given time. And if I just run this through a randomized simulator, um, we probably see an example where we'll end up with too many. Uh oh, so a lot of people got hungry. Got multiple people out at the store. There we go. <laughs> so what happened there? We can back up in time. So basically, the house was out of bananas, everyone was hungry, and then multiple people started heading to the store. So pretty much everyone went to the store. They started bringing back bananas, no coordination between themselves, and they ended up with 10 bananas. Very wasteful. Um, so if I go to the correct version of the problem, we can run this for a long time, and it will never hit a bug. And my fix is, when, I, when you go to the store, you now leave a note on the house that says, gone to store. And that prevents anyone else from heading out to the store. OK, I'm pretty confident this works. So that's a, that's a simple problem, uh, simple enough that I can show you the, the entire code for that in a couple minutes. Uh, but let me show you a couple other models first. Um, so this one is an elevator system. Uh, it's a nine-story building. Uh, these are people on the right that a little z means they're sleeping, uh, or a number is where they want to go. And the dot indicates where the elevator is going to stop. Uh, so this elevator is heading to floor 7 and 8, unloading a passenger. <coughs> cool. You're familiar with elevators, yeah? <laughs> um, so I can, let's see, I can kind of hover over these, and I can, I can figure out, uh, oh, this person is currently riding an elevator, and see all this information about it. Uh, this person's waiting. They're trying to get to floor three. Um, I can also get all that information down here for free. So this is the entire state of our system. Um, we've got people as that top array. Uh, floor controls is the, the little lights at the floor, whether they're lit up or not. And each elevator is... Uh, between a floor, at a floor, might have its doors opening, et cetera. So over here, I'm, uh, I've got a graph that's being built up of all the elevator rides that are happening. And I can run a simulation in the background using web workers um, where you know, a lot of elevator rides are taking place. I'm waiting for a bad one. It's bad, but it's not terrible. That's pretty bad. So now I can take that and click on it and try to figure out, well, why was this ride so bad? Um, in this case, they spent quite a bit of time waiting for an elevator and then quite a bit of time writing it. So when I click on that bar, 
It's actually moved the timeline over to uh, the start of that ride, highlighted the elevator that took so long, and highlighted that person up there on the, on the eighth floor that's waiting for an elevator to arrive. And now we can just watch it and see um, why, why was this so painful. The doors opened an extra time. Had to drop someone off and then turn around and pick someone up. So that wasn't too bad. And now one stop, two stops, three stops, four stops to go five floors is kind of embarrassing. Um, so you can imagine how you, you'd use this with a distributed system too. Um, and, and of course I have, I have a model of Raft here. Uh, so over here we've got five servers and a Raft cluster. Uh, those are the timeouts on the circumference. And uh, server three is about to time out and it starts an election. Uh, so did server two, but server three won leadership and so now that server's the leader. And it's, it's sending out heartbeats back and forth uh, to keep everyone else happy. <coughs> so it's the same idea, right? We have um, all of the servers are shown here. And of course, the leader has a lot more information because it has more work to do. So it's, it's basically tracking information for each of the other servers. Um, down here we have uh, messages in the network. So, you know, heartbeats being sent out, uh, the responses coming back, and then they disappear. Um, and I can actually interact with this. So I can, I can shut down our leader, uh, which forks the timeline. So now, now we're in kind of a parallel world um, I can submit a couple client requests and, and this new leader is going to replicate those out. Uh, what else? Yeah, so I, I mean I can basically interact with a, a full implementation of Raft that just doesn't have all the things you need for a production system, right? It's, it, it is just a model, um, but it, uh, it it does show that the protocol does what it's meant to do. Yeah. So I can, I presume I can replay a case if I want to? Yeah, you can, um, somewhere down here, I think you can actually download a, a log file with everything that's happened and send it to someone else. And no, but I, can I replay it to rub the bugs off? Something uh, mysterious happened, I don't know what it is. I wonder well, the exact same sequence over and over. With the same over. arbitrary decisions. Yeah, with the same sequence of operations. I see. Uh, no, that, that would be cool. It's not something it can do today, but a uh, pull request would be welcome. <laughs> so, so one issue is, um, like Raft is generating random numbers for all these timeouts all the time, uh, and you'd have to uh, probably put a seed on that, and then maybe you wouldn't be able to change the number of times you get a random number. Um, there, there's another trick you can use. I can talk to you about. Sweet. Um, okay. Oh yeah, another thing we can do is drop a message and see how that behaves. Um, I mean, basically, you get you get a lot more control here than you would in a in a running system. Uh, so let me let me restart because this is a little janky. Uh, another thing I can do I can flip this bit that basically says anytime a leader establishes itself, uh, we're going to restart and host another leader election. Uh, let me make sure that's working. So 
So server four became leader, we restart. And, uh, and we can basically do the same thing with, we did with the elevators, only now uh, it's leader elections instead. So we're running a bunch of elections in the background. And they're all taking about you know, 140 to 180 milliseconds. But every now and then, we'll see a split vote like that. Yeah, that's the case I want to repeat so I can find out. <coughs> well, so we can repeat it. We just can't change the code and then repeat it. <laughs> no, I mean, I want to um, run that one over and over again to see what caused that bad sequence. So now, so we can watch that. Uh, so I bet, yeah, it looks like server one, server two, and server three will time out at just about the same time here. Uh, and they need a majority of the votes in the cluster, so they need three votes to become leader. It's going to be really difficult for them. Nobody got all three votes, and then Raft does the simplest thing of just wait around for another timeout. Uh, so that was. That was our slow election. <laughs> um, any questions? OK, so um, I, know, I know that wasn't like terribly impressive. It's, uh, it's still really early on the project. and. Um, you can think of it more of a proof of concept than anything. But it is already showing uh, some value, right? And if we compare this to, to what I did uh, for Raft for my PhD, it was, uh, well, write the production-ready code. Almost production-ready, fine. It took me a few months after graduating to get it into production. Um, and then you know, write the TLA plus spec, so it's the specification, and also uh, did some model checking with it. Write, uh, write a visualization in JavaScript, so writing basically the same thing, different language. Uh, write a simulator in Rust to explore a whole bunch of leader election variations. And then write pseudocode to present <coughs> this compactly for other people to read it. Uh, there's no way that one's correct because it's never been run. But basically, you know, wrote it four times over, basically pretty much the same thing. Um, so if, and it, of course, if I change anything, now I have to go back and revise all these. But I hope not to. So, so with Runway, if that tool existed at the time, like maybe I could have written one model and gotten the same value out of all of it. Um, and you know, in my experience, the more things you do with a piece of code, the more you're, you're going to iron out the bugs and flesh it out. Um, so it's, it, it just would have been a better experience overall. Um, right. The, the other thing is, all, all these other things benefit from visualization. So if, if I'm trying to debug uh, an issue with my spec, it's really nice if I can just see it behave visually because when you know when a server does something it's not supposed to do, you just naturally spot it that way. Um, I guess I don't know. It's just wired into our brains. Okay, so so what does it mean? How do I build a runway model today? Um, so you need to produce a specification file and a view file. Uh, the spec is in a domain-specific language uh, that Runway interprets, and I'll get into that in a minute. 
Uh, the view is just off-the-shelf web stuff. So um, I tend to use JavaScript, D3. Uh, D3 is a, a library that helps with drawing and animating things. Uh, and then SVG for uh, what I'm actually manipulating on the screen. Um, so the view file and the spec file, they, in my experience, they tend to be about the same size. Um, but the view file is totally boring code that you should never look at. It's, it's got a job. It's supposed to take the state and draw it on the screen. Um, but you won't really learn anything from spending time on that code. Uh, where, whereas the spec, like ideally, this is what you'd be sharing with your uh, teammates to, to do re design reviews. Um, <coughs> So what I'd suggest you do is uh, start, start with a sketch of what it is you want your visualization to look like, um, because that's going to help you tease out like what is the core state in my system. Uh, and, and then you can kind of define that. So uh, the specification model is strongly typed. So you can define all those types and your state variables and start to create the view. Because as I said, the, the, once you've got the visualization, that helps you with debugging. If you've, if you've got the wrong transition rules after that, um, you can probably spot them. And, and then you can fill in your invariants and transition rules. Uh, one tip, like with Raft, you've got leader election and then you've got log replication. Uh, if you're working on the log replication stuff, you, you can just set an initial state where, I don't know, server one is the leader already. So you don't have to go through a leader election every time. Um, so as I said, the, the specification uh, is executable code, but it's, it's not, uh, you know, you, you run it through runway. It's not, uh, not, it is Turing complete. It's not a general purpose programming language. Uh, so you define all the state. Um, you define this. So you define types. You define state variables and a starting state. Uh, as a set of transition rules, um, and then invariants that you want to hold, so properties on the state that should be true uh, before and after applying every rule. Um, it's called a labeled transition system. It's similar to a state machine. Uh, and, and so you want to include in your transition rules not only the, the behavior that your system is supposed to have, but also the things that you want to go wrong in the model. So like in the raft model, a server can stop and then restart, and the message can be dropped or duplicated and <coughs> delayed. Um, and, and the way execution works is uh, applying the rule is atomic, and, and it runway will do one at a time. So uh, Take the starting state, apply a rule, apply a rule, apply a rule. Um, if multiple rules are active, then depending on, if, if you're running the simulator, it's just going to make a random choice. And if you're running the model checker, it's going to explore all paths. That, that's a very restrictive programming model. It's, it suits the JavaScript model. I mean, it's, it's, a commuting, it's event loop based. Because the rule is atomic, that means there's no interference of something else happening while the rule is running. So yeah, so what that means is you, if you want to permit concurrency in your model, you have to write small rules that you know, do a, take a step and then return. And then sometime later, they'll take the next step. Uh, but the benefit is now I'm, I'm not writing, I can model a concurrent system, but I'm not writing concurrent code. So I don't need mutexes. I don't need any explicit synchronization. Um, it, it works pretty well for distributed systems in my, in my experience. I, I don't know how well it would work for like very low level systems code. One of the common errors is starting to process a second message while you're processing the first one. That's a very common error in distributed systems. And you mess up your state. And you can never tell what happened because you never get that exact sequence again. <clears throat> Fair. Um, uh, 
Uh, one other interesting. Yeah. Is it fair to say that, that this is suited for a particular class of distributed systems and, and uh, that can be defined by uh, a serial set of rules? Good question. Um, so this is the way that, more or less, this is the way that all distributed protocols are modeled in the literature. So um, my test for a tool for distributed systems is can it model a distributed system such as your body, the cells in your body? And, 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 and in that kind of a system, you cannot have a, a, a single thread of, of rules. That doesn't mean there aren't systems that you, where you can. So, so the important thing is, um, since there's no shared state in a distributed system, we're communicating over messages. If two servers do something concurrently and then try to tell each other about it, uh, it's equivalent to if one took an action, the next took an action, and then they sent their messages, right? Um, and, and that's why this is the model is sufficient for a lot of uh, a lot of academic literature, but I don't ever think about human bodies and and so you know I, we have how many cells. In a fully distributed system, the link between two servers could go through n number of other servers. Yep. Well, let's, let's get a bit more concrete by looking at some of the code. Um, so this is the too many bananas problem. Um, we declare a variable for the number of bananas. Uh, and this is the correct version, so we need a Boolean to represent whether there's a note stuck on the house or not. Um, then we've got our people. Um, so room makes us an array of person indexed from one to five, and each person is either happy, hungry, going to the store, or returning from the store. Uh, so this is similar to an enum, except the different options can carry data. So when you're, when you're returning from the store, uh, there's how many bananas are you coming back with? And so the, the compiler will check that um, statically, you're only allowed to access carrying if you are in the state returning from store. Will it check against the assertion on the maximum number of bananas? Uh, that it'll do at runtime in between every rule. No, no, if I just say returning from store carrying zero to 10. Uh, no, it's not that smart. Because <laughs> model errors, that's a, a typical kind of model error. Anytime a number shows up in two places or a condition shows up in two places, you're often going to get them different. It'd be nice to have the compiler check that. True. Uh, and this just has one rule, but it's a, it's a multi-part rule depending on what state you're in. So for, for each of the roommates, so taking each one individually, uh, if they're happy, they can become hungry. And that would be an atomic state change, and then we'd break out of the match statement and return out of the rule, return control, uh, and then the system would be able to reevaluate. Um, if they're hungry and there's no bananas at home, but there's a note at the front of the house, well, we said they're not supposed to leave for the store because one of their roommates is already gone for the store. So they just, they do nothing, and they so they fall out of the if statements, they fall out of the match statements, uh, and they didn't change any of the state in the model. And so, uh, you know, the, the interpreter will look at that and say, okay, well, this person is inactive until any of the variables that it read changed. So if its state changes, if the number of bananas change, if that note goes away, then we'll reevaluate this person until then. Uh, they're not interesting. Um, if there was no note present, they could set one and head out to the store, and they do that atomically. Um, 
Or if there were bananas at home, they can eat one and become happy. Uh, if they're going to the store, they can come back with a random number of bananas between 0 and 8. <coughs> and when they're coming back, they add what they're carrying to the bananas at home, remove the note, and go back to hungry. And probably what they're going to do next is eat a banana. Uh, but this model permits um, the case where you go to the store, you bring back bananas, and your roommate eats them all before you get a chance. It can happen. Uh, I said that. Paul's going to hate me. <laughs> this one for you, Paul. Um, so, so what about time, right? The bananas problem is kind of asynchronous, doesn't care about time. But in Raft, time time's really important when you're asking about how long leader election takes. Um, so the way computer scientists <coughs> like to think about this is each server tries to approximate the global clock, the one that's out there in the sky that we synchronize to, the one at the root of the NTP hierarchy. <laughs> and physicists, uh, we've got one here you can talk to, will <clears throat> they will uh, correct us and, and they'll remind us that no, in fact, we've got relativity and all these other things and whatever. Um, the point is, uh, we, we need time. We, ne we need to think about time in our systems. Uh, and we want some of the properties, like in Raft, we want it to... Uh, Raft cannot just corrupt state because the clock's um, drift or have skew. Uh, we want some properties to hold no matter if uh, we spend a long time processing something or a message gets delayed. Um, and yet at other times if we're talking about availability or performance, like we, we absolutely need a watch to measure against because these are rates over time. Um, so, so Runway takes a pretty simple approach right now, which is uh, if you're running in the simulator, then this past function um, will consult a global clock. And if you're running in, an, in the model checker asynchronously, this past function will return true. So to give an example, uh, in Raft, once, once, you're, once you get through your randomized timeout, you're supposed to start a new election. Um, so you know, we've got this rule, start new election, that's defined over all of the different servers. And uh, if we're in the simulator, then this is just going to refer to a global clock. It's a global variable um, that just, you know, happens to be globally synchronized. Uh, <coughs> if we're model checking, on the other hand, this just always returns true. So any server can just time out at any time. Um, and that's what lets us check some of the safety properties. So again, it would be very useful to be able to assign a different clock to each node and allow, and, and allow for different drifts. Because again, when you're using timeouts, a lot of trouble appears from clock errors. Yep. Um, and that, yeah, that, that's one that we should do. Um, with Raft, all of the timeouts are randomized, so it does, it, you kind of get that anyway. Randomized across servers? Uh, every time a server generates a new timeout, it multiplies it by a random skew. That might be good enough. Um, but, but yeah, I, th I, think, I think you're right that we do need to bake something into the language for this. So the, it would be useful to uh, inject clock faults. Like and, that, and that you can do as a rule. Future or far in the past. Um, so I can, I can certainly define a rule that if uh, this server's offset from the global clock is now radically different from what it just was. Um, so I can model the clock as part of the, uh, part of the system then. So I could do the drift. Hmm. Yeah, I do Okay. I don't. I don't like. I don't have enough examples where it has or hasn't worked. Um, so I'm kind of not sure what the best thing here is. Um, happy to chat, Paul. <laughs> I, 
I like what you're doing, by the way. Don't, don't think I'm being critical. I'm not at all. I think this is great. Awesome. Um, okay, so to, to wrap up here, uh, I argued that we should be applying uh, new, you know, tools to help us define our distributed systems uh, beyond the, the whiteboard and alcohol. Um, models are, you know, whatever this is, it, it should be based on modeling because it helps focus our attention on the things that matter and leaves out unimportant details like memory allocation or whatever. Um, so Runway combines mo specification, model checking, simulation, and visualization into one tool. And the hope is that um, even though like most of the time we couldn't justify doing these things independently, if we pack it into one tool, uh, maybe there's enough value there to make it worthwhile. Um, so you can go check out the models, uh, build your own. Uh, this is all open source, so help develop Runway. Uh, and, you know, let's solve problems at the design phase. Uh, thanks. What written in? So it's, it's JavaScript right now, um, and, and that's mainly for the visualization part. Uh, when it comes to model checking, I, I'm not, not going to stand up here and tell you that JavaScript is the right language for that. Um, but I, I think we should probably be compiling down to an existing model checker. Um, that does work. A lot of times the, the difficulties only appear at scale. So how large a system can I run? I don't know. Um, I, so, you know, the, the runtime is not very efficient. I, I mentioned it's an interpreter right now. We should probably switch over to a compiler instead. Um, there's, your, your browser can do quite a bit, but it's, it's definitely limited. Um, I, probably terrible. I don't know. I've never checked. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it's also going to depend on um, like some of the you know the, these things down here um, we could just turn turn off if they're uh, like this is storing the complete state of of every step you take. Um, it's amazing how much you can get away with just doing anyway. Uh, and then the visualizations can get arbitrarily complex. Like, here's, um, here's one I like to show because I don't understand it at all. Uh, this guy, David, did it. So I, th I think he's modeling a, a financial system. Um, that's like most of my understanding here. So you can, and I'm not sure why, but you can drag around the, the graph. <laughs> Fine. Uh, let me get that back. Oh, come on. I mean, that's, that's how it went there, but anyhow, I can, uh, on some of these, I can make a request, and then it's, uh, oh, oops. Do you see that? It's, uh, it's sending messages back and forth. It's, it's doing fairly complex things. Uh, I, if, if we just had little rectangles, that might scale a whole lot better. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't pushed it. How much do you know about this example? Nothing. So I mean, one of my questions is, there's kind of two lobes. Do the two lobes run concurrently? Uh, Can I look at the I, source of the model? I really wish I could move uh, it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So da um, down here, it, it, we can see the code, and it's, uh, it's actually syntax highlighted even. Uh, and David wrote a giant explanation of what this is, maybe. Maybe we can just figure it out because we have a bunch of time. <laughs> uh, 
request traces. Uh, so intermediate nodes act as relay stations by receiving a message. Press in it to spark. Should probably take this offline, huh? <laughs> um, so the general approach that you're taking, I, I actually am very impressed with. It's, it's similar to, to Leslie Lamport's plea for us to be writing specifications before we write code. Um, you know, his notion that um, bridges don't fall down, but software systems do, and that's because bridges have architects <laughs> that design it before they build it. Um, so I think there's a, there's a lot here that is the right direction to go in. And clearly this is a basic tool that, that, that I think is headed in the right direction in many different ways. Um, I think of uh, the kind of things that can go wrong at scale in large systems as being, you know, right on a power law distribution of things that can go wrong, the things near the axis the most likely and the things further down the axis least likely. The things at the front we can deal with with design. We can do power, redundant power supplies, redundant this, you know, redundant plans, you know, to make sure that doesn't fail. But then we don't know how things are going to break, so we then put it in practice and we get it to production. Yeah. And then we fix it when we find things that go wrong. The problem is the area in the long tail is bigger than everything else up front. And the only way you can deal with the long tail is by being more formal about your model, about your verification, and about more disciplined about the way you build things. So I, I think that the, the gift you've given us here on Garo is, um, is Diego, sorry, is um, Potato. Is, is potato. Dr. Potato, potato, yes. <laughs> Keep forgetting. Is the gift you're giving us here is this, um, this vision that we, we, if we really want to scale our systems, despite the fact that the simulator may need some work to make it scale, we, we, the systems in practice, you can't, you can't go through enough of the things that can go wrong to really protect yourself from these random failures that are occurring in the long tail. All right, there were a lot of ideas in there. Um, so first, uh, on TLA Plus and Leslie Lamport's work. This is definitely all influenced by that. And I, I use TLA Plus uh, for Raft. And um, in, in part, this is just making it more accessible. Um, but it's, yeah, I mean, I, I like. So you are doing model checking when you compile the model. It, there is a placeholder that technically does model checking. Okay. Um, it's not efficient. Then again, neither is TLA plus. <laughs> but you, I mean, you, you, you have a programming language. Yeah, right? it's. You need a debugger, right? Um, so on, on Paul's point about scaling, I think, yeah, I, th I think there are, I mean, we talk about these systems that scale to thousands of servers. A lot of them are actually organized um, into small groups of a handful, and, and they would fit this quite nicely. Uh, and if you can show, uh, I mean, convince yourself that it works in all cases, then then that gets rid of your tail. But of course, there's there's all the unanticipated problems, the the things with highly unlikely probability that you encounter only after so many machine hours, and this can't help you there. But <laughs> the, the like the you know, random bit flip. Uh, but this should help, um, say, with deadlock detection. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, I, I should. The model checker should tell me I have a potential deadlock before I even run it. Yes. Right. Um, I'm curious if um, you used it to it's on bugs in systems you produced. Uh, so far, or maybe so, not, you aren't at that point yet. So the only. The only example I've got is, um, uh, so I, I was helping out a, a team. We, we were sitting around whiteboards for three days. And then on the fourth day, I went off and wrote a model of it. Uh, well, at the very end of that third day, we took a picture of the board. And then we kept talking a little bit and discovered a bug. But it didn't, uh, so we, we updated the board, but didn't take a new picture. Uh, on the fourth day, I was going by the picture. I had forgotten about that bug, and the model checker found it again. <laughs> so almost. <laughs> um, that, and that was a concurrent, not distributed system. 
But can't the principles that you've used here be um, used in a parallel version of this that can be deployed on AWS from much larger I, scale simulation? Uh, I mean, there's only so much you can, as a human, there's only so much visual input you can take in. Uh, if you're just trying to collect data, like if I wanted to know over a billion runs of raft leader election, what's the performance? Sure. <laughs> Or what are the oddest conditions? How often do the, you know, the, 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 does the condition occur that um, you, could, you, you, you put watches on it? That's what you do on a, even when you're debugging a single system, you put a watch right. on things and let the ring run until it hits the watcher. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the scalability problem, you'd have to make this a distributed system itself yes. to run across a thousand nodes. Yeah. yeah. And then hope no nodes system. crash. A resilient distributed system. Well, if you, if you lose a few simulations, I don't think it's a big deal. But. So I'd like to support your comment. I think what you're doing is great. I think it's absolutely needed. And, you know, we're all frustrated because you're beginning, not ending. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all looking for the end. Yeah, and it's, it's difficult. I mean, if, um, it's, it's, a hard, it's hard to get people to shift to adopting this and, and doing it early enough for it to have value. Um, so I, I don't know, uh, you know, maybe here in, a, in an academic setting where visualization might be more important, maybe it could get a foothold. Um. I've done something similar, but I had to write JavaScript. So I'm writing what this compiles to, basically, and that's much harder. Oh. So this, this would be very nice to have for the, what I've and, done for Paul. And what problem were you? Modeling there. distributed data center. Cool. Yeah. So, but I've always written scripting code as the first implementation, not going directly to production. Right. For exactly the reason you point out here. Can you say something about your experience with Rust? Um, did it give you any surprises? Were the things that uh, you like things that you dislike? Uh, I was also very curious about that. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I should preface it with uh, this was Rust version 0 0.8, so uh, a while ago now. And this was back when uh, there were a few more symbols around different pointer types that you could have that I, I believe they've simplified since then. Um, it, so, so, this, so I, I wrote uh, just what I was describing, a, a simulator. Uh, it was parallel, not distributed, for raft leader election. And I was messing with the algorithm and, and seeing uh, how it would behave under different assumptions. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's fast. It kept me from shooting myself in the foot a couple times, even though I've written a lot of C++. <laughs> um, it, it also, uh, you know, the type system got in the way a couple places, and, and it, you have to, you have to think about how you'll design your program to uh, to satisfy the type checker ahead of time. Uh, so I think it it takes some transition period. I would say the type system getting in the way is a positive thing. It prevents you from making very hard to find errors. Yeah. Um, no. There, there's there's some good, some bad. There is, and and I as I said, it's improved since then. But there's like. Um, you know, there's some patterns, like, I, I think at the time, say, say you did a for loop to do a linear search, you find the element you want, and then you want to update that element and break out of the loop. Uh, I wouldn't let you do that at the time. I think you can now. Would you use this again? Would I use Rust again? Only if I had an excuse to. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, uh, it, it's a fun language. I like it a lot compared to C++, um, but practically speaking, I don't have an excuse to use either one right now. <laughs> I've been writing Go code lately. Okay, uh, I'm happy to stick around with quest to chat or answer questions, but I think that's it.